Reagan wants me to video the speakers and everything. <laughs> across the crowd and I see a lot of brothers and sisters in Christ. I see a lot of family members. We're glad that you all have come to celebrate with us uh, a wonderful uncle, a wonderful daddy, a wonderful brother, a wonderful grand daddy, great grandfather, you know, a uh, brother in Christ to many of you. Uh, a great friend to others. On behalf of our family, we thank you all for coming today. If you don't know me, I'm Daryl Bowman. They call me Bub. I'm a nephew uh, of a great family. And uh, we love each other. Uh, we might have fought some when we were younger, but uh, uh, we make up and we do love each other. And we love you too. And we thank you so much for coming. We're going to open the ceremony at this time with a prayer. Our great and holy Father in heaven, we thank you, Father, for a beautiful day that we could come together, even though it's a loss in, in our family. We're so thankful for the memories that we have, the time that we have together, the friends and family that would gather today. And it is a celebration of a wonderful man that we've learned to love and, and grown up with. We've sat at his feet. We certainly know that uh, as witnesses here, that he was a wonderful person in his family. He was a wonderful person uh, to teach us about the most important things in life, the gospel. We thank you, Father, for being with all of us this day. And we would ask that you would help the immediate family, all of us, in our loss, in our hurt, in the days to come, that you would be with uh, his uh, children and grandchildren, that you would bless them, Father, in their time of need, that we would help them with uh, uh, communications and phone calls and cards to just show them that we love them very much and that we acknowledge. We thank you for such a great soldier in Christ as Delbert was and that now that he can rest for eternity. We thank you Father for others that are willing to sacrifice their time and to teach us and that we can sit at their feet, Father, and learn of you and their great examples as Delbert was to us and our family. May we be like him, a good soldier in the force of Christ. Just be with us this day, and it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. 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 <clears throat> Delbert Earl Bowman was born Seneca, Missouri, out on the prairie, of course, we're out on the prairie, Swash Prairie, on the 12th of August, 1938, to Willis Bowman and Ida Lovita Langford Bowman. Delbert fought a good fight, finished the course, kept the faith, and received his award, reward in death on March the 8th, 2024 in Anderson, Missouri. He was preceded in death by his parents, both wives, an infant daughter and son, and his two brothers, Daryl and Willis Dwayne Bowman. He is survived by five children, his sisters, Julia, Judy, husband, Larry Johnson, Brenda, husband, Leon Selk, Kathy, husband, Steve Letts, and two sister-in-laws, Shirley Bowman and Sue Bowman, as well as a num numerous nieces, nephews, and longtime friends. 
Delbert married his sweetheart, Sandra Ann Sandy Salee, on a Sunday after worship on June 1, 1958. They had a love-filled marriage dedicated to serving Christ, each other, and their children. To get together, they had seven children. Sandy K. Bowman, she died June 1959. Teresa Gersich, husband Jeff. Jason Lee Bowman died April 1961. Sarah Ayers, husband GB. Gina Costa, husband Ivan. Shelly Moore, husband Frank, and Travis Bowman. Sandy preceded De Delbert in death on March the 20th, 1995. Delbert and Sandy shared eight grandchildren. And I'll tell you, they loved them very much. They, uh, they talked a lot about them. And they adored them. Thaddeus Ayers, Candace Ayers, Bohance, Reagan Ayers Anderson, Nathaniel Ayers, Cameron Costa, Chandler Moore, Connor Moore, and Christian Moore. They also had eight great grandchildren. His quiver is full, Psalms 127 and 5. On the 7th of July, 1995, Delbert married Glenda Smith. She preceded Delbert, as she lovely, lovingly called him, in death on October of 2020. And this is very true about my uncle. Delbert could fix just about anything that he put his hands to. He spent much of his free time working mechanically on whatever he could get his hands on. He retired from Boeing in 1994 and spent his retirement traveling and visiting with old and new friends. And certainly my uncle Delbert, he never met a stranger. He would talk to anybody like a lot of members of our family do. <laughs> He loved learning about history and working on crossword puzzles, studying the Bible, and singing hymns. Delbert was a lifelong member of the Church of Christ, where he took an active part in preaching the Word of God. Above all else, Delbert's faith in God and his promises showed throughout his lifetime. Delbert's family would like to thank the memory care nurses and aides at McDonald County Living Center in Anderson, Missouri for loving and dolting on him for the last almost four years. He was, a very, he was very happy and content there. Also would like to thank the Regional Hospice Center, especially Brandy Rowe for her outstanding care of Delbert at the end of his life. But I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which asleep, that you sorry not, even as others which have no hope. My uncle certainly had hope. First Thessalonians 4 and 13. We love you. We're going to miss him just like you are. And uh, he loved the family very much. It was very special to us in this life. Thank you very much. Precious memory. So precious memories on angels. <laughs>
family and I moved to the Puget Sound area of the state of Washington, particularly near Tacoma. And I'd moved there for reasons with Patty. I'd moved there for work reasons with Patty and our three oldest daughters at the time, who when we moved were four years old, two and two months. <laughs> we lived there for about two years before we heard that Delbert and Sandy were coming to that area because of Delbert's job with Boeing. I knew Delbert a little because Gina, his daughter, spent a lot of time with my sister Kathy, but I didn't know him all that well. After they moved to Washington, that's when Patty and I really got a chance to get to know Delbert and Sandy well. Many of us here know that things often work out in ways we don't fully understand at the time. I can't say that I perceived having any needs at the time that they moved to Washington, you see, because I was young and overconfident and thought I had every challenge met. I talked myself into believing that, of course. But when Delbert and Sandy came, I quickly saw how much my kids needed them and how much my wife needed them and how much I needed them. It was just right and at the right time. My children needed grandparents more than I realized. 
as a grandparent myself now 11 times over, I understand that a little bit better than I did at that time. But Patty and my parents were over 1,900 miles away at the time, and none of them could be accused of being travelers at the time. This was well before FaceTime and video chats and things like that, and so only a quick hello on the landline phone occasionally would hope to fill that need. But calls had to be kept short because you paid by the minute for long distance at the time. But when the Bowmans arrived, they filled that gap. It was a gap that was clearly missing for my girls. My oldest daughter, Christy, tells me that she remembers very distinctly asking Dobert and Sandy if they could call them Grandma and Grandpa. Of course, they both immediately said, of course you can. And from that time forward, they were Grandpa Delbert and Grandma Sandy in our house to the day they passed. They let the girls sit next to them in church, which is something that my two oldest remember. One of their most vivid memories of living in Washington was sitting next to them in church. Patty and I developed a quick relationship with both of them, and we needed them. All aspects of them we needed. They were family. I personally found Delbert to be something <clears throat> that I needed in my life at the time. My own father and other mentors that I had at the congregation at 85th and Euclid in Kansas City that I had left couldn't fill that in role anymore because I'd separated myself through the many miles that were there. I took with them the lessons that they had taught me earlier, but as I already said, there were so many more lessons I needed to learn. And Delbert fell right into that slot for me. He wasn't perfect, none of us are. And he needed Sandy's help at times to stay between the rails in a few areas. <laughs> but he was a pseudo-dad for me. Let me tell you some of the things that I remember about Delbert. And those of you who know him even longer than I do, you'll recognize him, I'm pretty sure. At that point in my life, before I met Delbert, I don't know that I'd ever seen a man who gave all his sermons without using any notes, other than Taylor Joyce. But I must say that Taylor was a little more disciplined in his delivery than Delbert was. <laughs> if Delbert had a chapter study covering 20 verses, the first verse would get 35 minutes. The second verse would get 15, and the rest, the 18 verses remaining, got 5 or 10 minutes. And I can tell you, I am very educated on the first two verses of many chapters in the New Testament. <laughs> Delbert was always, though, ready, as was already said, to get ready to give a defense to anyone who would ask him of the hope that lied within him. He was always ready. He knew God's word. He trusted God's word. He loved God's word. I found in Delbert a man who wore his faith on his sleeve in a good way. There would be times when he and I would talk about something we wished to do with the congregation in Tukwilak, Washington, and I might show some hesitancy for some reason. Delbert would say, Jim, don't you think God is big enough to handle that? I do. He always was ready to go forward. God was never too small to handle anything for Delbert. He lived by faith and not by sight. And another personal recollection that I have regarding that and relative to the fact that we really only lived in the same vicinity for four years. But the lessons I learned were for a lifetime. For Delbert, the idea of living by faith extended beyond just spiritual things, though. Sometimes I expect the Sandy's chagrin over things. But for example, this is only a slight stretch to say Delbert owned more vehicles while he was in Washington than I had my entire life. <laughs> And it's only a little bit of a longer stretch to say he owned more houses <laughs> in that period of time than I had. He didn't ever have a lot.
lot of money, but he didn't need it. He would find someone who would barter with him for almost anything, and that included cars and houses. It seemed like the entire world was just a flea market to him sometimes. And he would always, because of his nature of being willing to talk to anyone, would find that person that would take care of whatever he thought was the need. And as they said, he could fix anything. The car that he traded for didn't have to run. The house he traded for didn't have to have all the walls standing up. <laughs> but he would get it anyway, and he would make it work. I miss his smile and his chuckle before he would tell me something that I was overcomplicating <laughs> with my analytical approach to life. When G.V. and Sarah and their family moved to Washington a couple of years after Delbert and Sandy came, I have to admit I was a little worried that things might change when they arrived. We were glad for their arrival, but reality was reality. They would have their own family with them then, and they would have their own grandchildren with them then. They would surely prioritize that relationship. But no, that didn't happen. They both just reached down deeper. They found enough time for everybody, so nobody lacked. No one. Our families became lifelong friends. And nothing skipped a beat. A few months ago, I had an opportunity to think about my, excuse me, my personal growth, and I needed to acknowledge the impact Delbert had on my life to someone. Of course, he was in the, the care center that was taking care of him. Dementia had put him in a position where he wouldn't recognize me any longer. He may not even remember the time that we had there. And so I felt the need to talk with someone about that and to share my thoughts. And so I sent these short words to Sarah and Gina. The four years or so I had together with Delbert and Washington were so important to my growth as a Christian over the last 35 years. The personal encouragement he gave me to trust in God and go forward has stayed with me. His teaching was just what I needed at the right time. And so I say to him through you, thank you for your teaching for your personal help. It means so much to me in these days of reflection. So to all the Bowman family, especially because of what I've said to Sarah and GV and, and Thad and Candace and Nathaniel and Reagan, thanks to all of you so much for sharing Delbert with us. <coughs> Come to the garden, oh come with me, come and to see what we might see. Yeah.
service, I asked them, what uh, what do you remember and what memory stands out to you? And he said, just a spiritual giant in that high tenor voice. I'm Bob Loudermilk, for those that haven't met me, and uh, I'm going to share a few memories. I was thinking on the way here, the power of memory. Have you ever thought about that? God gave us memory. And that can keep us out of problems and learning from our mistakes. Memories can bring blessings to our soul. You know, I was thinking about Luke 2. Two times in the book of Luke, chapter 2, the Bible says that Mary treasured up things in her heart. One was when Jesus was born and the shepherds came. And because of that situation, it says she, she treasured those things up in her heart. The same chapter, Jesus, they can't find him for days, and finally they find him teaching, and they don't understand it. Jesus explained, don't you understand that I have to be about my father's business? And it says that she treasured those things up in her heart. So I'm going to speak for a few minutes this afternoon because those of you that knew Delbert have things that are treasured up in your heart. Memories are a blessing. The Bible says the memory of a righteous man is a blessing. There's a lot of things that you have as treasures. I was watching years ago. I'm not a follower of Dr. Phil, but I happened to see a short clip of him and Oprah. And Oprah was watching and looked like she was going to jump out of her skin. As Dr. Phil counseled someone that had lost a child as a young adult and it just destroyed her life and he asked her he said do you think maybe you want to go back and think about what you had for 27 years and she said i never thought about it that way what's so interesting about memory people say you know two things that i'm going to debunk right now i'll check this before i tell you what i was getting ready to say they say, well, you know, someone died. You can't live forever. That's wrong. You can live forever. And the other one I hear is, well, you can't change the past. Well, actually, you can if you're born again. But there's another way you can change or reframe the past. I don't know very many people that go through childhood and don't come out with some scars, some things they can dwell on and think about. And take the treasures that are in your heart and remember those things. And that's what I want to talk about for a few minutes. The year was 1977. It was summer and fall. I was invited to hold a meeting in the Osho, Missouri. Never been there. Thought it was a small country church. When we pulled up, I told my wife, this is not the right place. There's too many cars here. And it was the right place. And I was told, you'll be staying with a couple, Delbert and Sandy Bowman, they have five children. So that was my introduction. The meeting began on Wednesday. We were there five days. The year rolled forward to the next year, and I got a call that really excited me. It was Delbert. He said, I think we're going to be moving to Wichita. And they did. In August of 1978, with their oldest child at age 17, Teresa, and their youngest child, uh, seven, Travis, and then three beautiful daughters in between. Thank you for letting me know the ages, by the way. <laughs> but that began a friendship that's just been fantastic. I am very close to this family in many ways. I think the first time they came to Wichita was Sandy's birthday. And we had bagels. You put egg, cheese, bacon, cream cheese, it's wonderful. If you want the recipe, let me know. They had never had it. In fact, Shelly said they still have those. 
And I put a candle on Sandy's bagel because it was her birthday. And I don't know how many times your mom brought that up to me. I remember that candle on that bagel. That was her birthday celebration. I remember very clearly the night Delbert and I left on a Friday to go move them to Wichita. He was already working in Wichita. And uh, we went down in the big U-Haul truck and Saturday we loaded them up, drove back to Wichita to, and took the truck to Mount Hope, Kansas to a neat home that they were living in. And I couldn't believe it. Monday, Sandy called and said, we wanna have you guys over for dinner. And I could not believe my eyes when we got there. Everything was perfect. Everything was set up. Dinner was prepared on a Monday. Could have been a Tuesday, but I think it was a Monday. I thought, how did you do that? I guess five years. Save on his gentle prayers. There by his love or shame. Sweetly my soul shall rest. Safe in the arms of Jesus. Save from corroding care. grandson, dad, uh, Jeevy and Sarah, my mom and dad, and I just wanted to share just a little bit about the perspective from the grandkids. Um, kind of thinking about this, and I kind of came to a conclusion. I had three grandpa moments. <laughs> I'm going to share all three of them um, that we knew. Don't worry, it won't be that long. <laughs> I wrote it down, so I won't uh, 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 veer off course as my... my my grandfather was known to do, and some of us are. <laughs> so, um, but uh, as I said, there were three Grandpa Bowmans we knew, and they they really each reflected distinctly the season of his life. I know it's a bit backwards, but we're going to start at the end and work toward the beginning, so to speak. So Grandpa number three, this is the man that here at the end part of his life, well, dependent on others and memory care and things like that. Um, one thing I noticed is every time I got to see him, he had a huge smile on his face. I don't know that I ever saw a picture of him, even in that, where he didn't have a big, uh, just that big toothy grin that's grandpa's. In 2019, my wife and my two boys at the time, um, we decided to add a daughter later, um, but uh, we went and visited him in Houston, Missouri. It was Houston, right? Is that where he was? Okay. <laughs> um, we took him out for the day, which, by the way, it surprised me how little security there was at that place. I said, can we take him out? And they said, sure. I said, what do we need to do? Take him. <laughs> you know. 
having, having worked in schools, I thought maybe there's a sign-out procedure or something. I guess not. Um, but in the span of, I'm going to guess, roughly two hours, we ate lunch, we went to Walmart, we played at the park, and we decided to go ahead and have supper, too. And it was literally, we did those things, and Grandpa said, well, let's go eat. So we went and ate again. And uh, he just loved spending that time with his great-grandchildren. The, the one thing I've got stuck in my head is him feeding my middle son, Collier, waffles. He had ordered this thing of waffles, and I don't know if, I don't remember what happened, but Collier enjoyed it, and Grandpa just kept cutting him a piece and just <laughs> stuffing it in his little mouth. He just thought that was great. I'm glad we got to experience that, man. Grandpa number two is the one... In a lot of ways, the other grandkids, except for Candace and I, got to know. And I didn't understand it before. But now I realize a large part of this time, sorry. A large part of this time was marked with grief and the struggle that came with that time of his life. Glenda was a good wife and grandmother in her own right, but well, my grandma Sandy can't be replaced. I know most of you who are, most of you grandchildren don't have memories uh, much of my grandpa because because much of my grandpa's memory was impacted at that time. Plus he did quite a bit of moving through that time too. But here's what a couple of my cousins and, and siblings have said from that second period. This is the best I could get in, in, in the time span that I that I uh, uh, Gabe. So, um, my brother Nate, he said, I'll never forget at my high school graduation party when my dad asked people to share stories about me. Grandpa immediately chimed in with one of my more embarrassing childhood stories. They couldn't remember what it was. I wish, uh, hopefully, maybe we can find it and, and you know, tell it again. Uh, but he said, 18 year old me was mortified, but now I just love to hear him chime in with something about me. My sister Reagan said, uh, one time in evening church services, he led a song that had like 12 verses in it. <laughs> it was quite a mess. And none of us had ever sung that song before, of course. But he led every single verse, and it took like 10 minutes. It was the invitation song on <gasps> Sunday morning. <laughs> <laughs> After that, that ordeal, somebody had plenty of time to think during that, that invitation, so I'll say that much. When he sat down, he looked at me and he said, well, that could have gone better. <laughs> this is what Reagan said. And then after church, we were asking him about that song, and he said, I had never heard it before. <laughs> and I thought, if I'm going to lead it, might as well commit to the whole thing. <laughs> You don't even have to have him here, and you just you can hear that conversation. <laughs> Cameron told me he thinks his fondest memories. He didn't really. He didn't. My cousin Cameron didn't have anything specific, uh, but just coming back and visiting and feeling special, spending time with Grandpa, and just doing everyday things like going out to eat. He did have that ability to just make little things seem just kind of special. You know, you always enjoy your special time with your grandparents anyway. So Grandpa number one. This is the one who selfishly Candace and I uh, got to experience until Grandma Sandy passed. I think it's safe to say the loss of his first wife and our grandmother significantly impacted his mental health. But he was a great grandfather and fun to be around. Maybe this will give you some insight into him as well. Sorry, I'm going to go on one more tirade. You know, it's, it's something that I notice is you don't learn about the people you love, some of these people you love, until they're gone. And you learn more about them at this time than you will you would have known had you been around them your whole lives. But this period is also interesting because we incidentally include, as as Jim mentioned, the Bradford girls, because they sp also spent a significant amount of time with them, and also called them Grandpa Delbert and Grandma Sandy. I had to edit some of this because uh, Jim already mentioned some of it, but uh, yeah. But um, Candace. One thing she mentions, when we lived in Washington and would stay the night at Grandma and Grandpa's, at some point in the evening, while Grandpa was reading his paper and flipping through the TV, and he flipped through the TV, 
wait, it drove us Candace and I crazy because it would be one channel, five seconds, next channel, five seconds, one, and we would find something we wanted and we'd be like, Grandpa, go back to that. Here, it'd be like five channels away. Um, he never just sat and watched. He would, he would kind of work through all the, all, the, all the things. Anyway, Candace would climb up on his lap, pull the paper down, newspaper, and slowly tell him in my most scary tone of voice, it's time to get serious. <laughs> I proceed to absolutely beat him up with everything I had in me. He would howl like I was really hurting him, but he also laughed to tears. As I got older, he would always bring up how those were some of the fondest memories of me. Getting serious. Those, those teeth sticking out every time he'd say it. Beating him up in his recliner. He also um, gave Candace a pocket knife when she was three and taught her how to whittle, too. So, you know. <laughs> Take that for what it's worth. Uh, Christy Frizzell, Bradford, or was Bradford, she said, uh, uh, she, she uh, mentioned that it was, it, it's fascinating to her the fact that Candace just didn't know that we weren't, we and the Bradfords weren't actually cousins until she was like 10. That says a lot. You know, that, uh, they did love them just like they were their own. Jennifer uh, Blake Bradford um, said that every memory of them felt just like home. They felt like my own grandparents. And I felt taken care of and loved, and they truly did love us. Here's a, a couple of, uh, and here's here's mine, and then I'll I'll uh, be merciful to you. Um, Grandpa would always tell me, and I, I, I it's just ingrained in my memory. I don't remember it, but he did. Said so when I would pick up something heavy, I called him, say it, it too heavy, it too heavy, Papa. And he never, never did fail to tell me that. Never told him, never failed to tell me about that. How I talked to him, just the way I can't, I'll never get it right. The way he said "pop off" was just spot on. When Grandpa would come home from work at Boeing, he'd sit in his recliner, and uh, Candace and I would remove his boots. He'd let us do that. Those black or I think maybe dark brown. Uh, Travis and I were talking about his his boots. Those those leather boots. To get off. I mean, and most of the time, Candace and I pull until we'd end up on the floor with a empty boot laying on our chest and the wind knocked out of us getting those things off. But then about a year before Grandma Sandy passed, we were in California, and uh, Candace and I flew to Washington to visit. And the one thing I remember, this is the only thing I remember uh, uh, from that trip, is I asked to go to a Mariners game, and he made it happen. I thought that was pretty wonderful. And on another occasion, when we visited him in Missouri, this was uh, oh, probably about 20 years ago now, or more, um, we got fudge from somewhere, and uh, he let me eat the whole plate. <laughs> that summer I gained a lot of, memory, a lot of weight. <laughs> Last memory I have of him is my grandpa. We were on a road trip. I almost forgot about this one, but this, this wasn't too long ago. I don't know how long ago, but we were on a road trip, and I don't remember who we were with, but I remember... We stopped to use the bathroom somewhere, and Grandpa was out of the gas station and came out sauntering. And that's the only way I can explain how my Grandpa would walk. He sauntered everywhere he went, and was never in a hurry wherever he walked. And he had a bunch of bananas in his hand he had just bought in the gas station. Comes out, gets in the car, and hands it around. He goes, when you urinate, you lose all your potassium, so you need more potassium. <laughs> I looked it up. It's, I don't think I don't know if that's exactly true, <laughs> but every time I uh, get bananas, I, I pretty well think of that. And I have to keep myself from saying it too. He for sure he loved us and he did his best. And given the circumstances, all three grandpas were good men. He loved the Lord, loved the church, and I appreciate his faithfulness and example. Thanks. Let's sing faith is funeral. So. That's what I'm going to do today, do somewhat here. So in preaching, what I'm going to do is tell some stories. I'm going to do a chapter study from John, the 21st chapter. It's 25 verses, so I'm do it in Delbert Bowman style. No, I'm not. <laughs> but as Bub pointed out, Bub read in the obituary, Delbert was born, born on the prairie, on Swarsh Prairie. Literally, he was born over there across the street. There was a house there that his mom and dad lived in, and that's where he was born. And he'll be buried here. So that life has come full circle from there now to here. 
full circle is a theme that we can use on many, many things here. Gilbert, as we said, has said before, devil, never to a stranger. He would talk Bible with anybody, talk about life with anybody, and he was, he was, a, he was a good man. And a lot of variety in his life and so many things. Psalm 116, verse 15 says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And I believe that this is a precious, marks a precious time in the sight of the Lord. Psalm 90 says, and selecting a few verses out of it, Lord, thou hast put our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, wherever thou hast formed the earth, we and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Again, it says, For all of our days are passed away in thy wrath, and we spend our years as a tale that is told. Some translations say as a sigh. The days of our years are threescore years and ten, that's seventy years, and if by reason of strength, their strength and labor and sorrow, uh, if by reason, um, wow, by reason of strength there be fourscore, yet their strength and labor and sorrow, for to soon come off and we fly away. Who knows the power of your anger? Even according to your fear, so is your wrath. So teach us to number our days so that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Delbert lived 85 years, a little more than that 80 that's mentioned there in the psalm. And so he stretched that number, stretched that number a bit. There's a story that's told. And as you say, stories that are told, they're true stories. They have the basis in fact. Now, it may have been embellished sometime over the years with the telling. But Delbert and his two brothers, Brother Darrell, or his brother Darrell and his, and his uh, younger brother, uh, Dwayne. 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 They all went fishing one night, <laughs> fished all night out on the bluff. I don't know where that is, but you're from around here you do. They fished all night out on the bluff and hadn't caught anything. As the night wore on, it got colder, and they still hadn't caught anything. They kept fishing, and uh, so eventually it got colder, and they built a fire. They built a big, roaring fire, and they fished all night, and still hadn't caught anything. And the next morning, when the sun came up, they looked, and they realized that the fire had burned through the fishing lines, and that's what they had done. <laughs> said, I'm going fishing, and they all joined him there. They went out and they fished. They fished all night. And this in John, the 21st chapter, I'm not going to read this. In John, the 21st chapter, this was after Jesus had been raised from the dead, after he had been crucified before that, and after that tumultuous night of his trial and his betrayal, when Judas betrayed him, that Peter had determined and said, I'm going to stay with you, Lord. Oh, everybody forsake you. I will die with you. And then Peter didn't. Matter of fact, Peter, that night, denied that he even knew Jesus. Sit by the, warmed himself by the fire of the enemies of the Lord there. And denied that he knew him. Denied with an oath that I knew him. I know not the man, he said. Jesus turned and looked at him as, as you remember the story. And Peter went out and wept bitterly at the betrayal that he had given to the Lord. Well, Christ was crucified that, on that, at, at that time. And three days later, he rose from the dead. He appeared to his disciples. He appeared to Peter at least two times. And this night, Peter said, let's go. I'm going fishing. We're going fishing. That was his trade. That was his work, his occupation. And that was James and uh, James and John, two brothers there, speaking of brothers, going fishing. They went with him as well, and some of the others did as well. A total of seven there on that. They fished all night. They fished all night. And so, nothing much to do except to try to find fish, and so what do you do in that? Memories. 
you have memories is what Peter did, I'm sure. Peter probably remembered that same lake, the Lake of Galilee. That's where, that's where a long time ago, and it's recorded in Luke the fifth chapter. That's where Peter, or Peter first, or one of the first times that he met Jesus, Jesus used his boat, borrowed his boat to teach from. And when he got done, he said, he said, Peter fish got in the net so much that the nets were beginning to break. And he called for his business partners, James, Peter and James, no, James and John, sorry, come over to help them. And they, they pulled that back in there, and there's a huge catch of fish there. And Peter realized that there was something else going on here in this, and Jesus saying this. And he fell on his knees, and he says, Lord, depart from me, for I'm a sinful man. Jesus just simply looked past that and he said, he said, come with me, come with me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they left all and followed him. That had happened at that lake. That was also at that lake that Peter one time stepped out of a boat onto the water and walked on the water to meet Jesus on that same lake of, of Galilee there. Amazing. That was also the lake at another time when Jesus calmed the storm and saved Peter and the other apostles from drowning there on that lake. That was the lake nearby that lake that Jesus, uh, that Peter witnessed and saw Jesus so many times preaching and healing people and giving them a new life there. Perhaps those things were going through his mind that night as he was fishing as it came toward morning, because as he came toward morning, then things were interrupted. He was interrupted by a sound. It was sound. They were off outside, off the shore a ways there in John 21, about 100 yards off the shore. And uh, all of a sudden, the sound, somebody says, breaks the silence there. There's a guy on the shore, and he says, basically what he says is, you boys caught anything out there? King James translation says, do you children have any meat? Basically saying, you caught anything? And so, you know, if you're a fisherman, and you're out fishing and you're not having any luck, the last thing you want to hear is some joker on the shore saying, hey boys, you caught something, anything? You caught anything tonight? <laughs> and not only that, but the worst thing is, is when that joker starts giving you advice. Jesus know how to play him. So Jesus from the shore says, he says, throw the net out on the right side of the boat. That's where the fish are. They've probably done that 50 times that night. So they did. They threw it out there. And a bunch of fish, lots of fish, got in that net, came in their net suddenly there. Now, they didn't know it was the Lord on the, on the shore there. They did not recognize. Surely they should have re remembered what had happened before because it had happened before there. And when they pulled that net up and saw all those fish there, out there, out, John, the Apostle John, he said, look back, he said, it's the Lord. He recognized, knew, knew the situation. And Peter grabbed his clothes, put it around him, and jumped in the water and swam to the shore. Peter, who had denied Jesus, Peter, who had turned away from him there, Peter, who had, had he didn't know where his status was, I don't think it was with the Lord. And I can imagine what it must have been to see Peter coming out of that water there, all wet and dripping, and put his eyes on Jesus. He was the first one there, and what kind of conversation happened there? I don't know what was said. Jesus could have said, Peter, why did you turn away from me? Why did you turn your back on me? You promised you wouldn't. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say what they said. It doesn't say what they said. The boat was about 100 yards out, and so when they got in, they pulled it in. There was 153 large fish, the scripture says, in the net. And Jesus already had a fire going on the shore. And he had fish on that. Now, I'm not sure exactly where he got it. He had bread on that fire heating up there. And he said, come children. He said, let's have breakfast, essentially. And so they ate. They added some of their fish to it there. They ate. And then afterwards, 
After that, all evil. Peter is addressed by the Lord. And Peter says, do you love me? And Jesus says, do you love me more than me? And Peter says, yes, I love you. He says, feed my sheep. He repeats it again, and I'm not going to go into the details, the differences in the ways that I've been talked about. But three times he asks him, do you love me? He says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus says, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. And so it is here in Peter's life that Peter comes full circle with the Lord. And the Lord comes full circle with Peter. Because as he called him once before, he lets Peter know, even though you have strayed, even though you have turned away, even though you have denied me, now if you love me, I've got work for you to do. I've got work for you to feed my sheep. Notice he didn't say follow me here because, you know, that didn't make sense because Jesus is going to heaven here in a long a little bit. He says, I'm going to And so, the idea of going full circle. <laughs> Gilbert went full circle many times. He was born there, moved to Wichita, moved to Washington, and when Sandy got bad sick, came full circle, came back here. He and Glenda married, and as their health failed, you know, they moved all around, and Delver preached a little bit everywhere and, and, and had houses a little bit everywhere. But as their health fell, they came out to California to stay near us. And then I came back here. And I remember, Jeremy, you probably remember what your mom would say. I want to go home. I want to go home. And home was southwest Missouri. And they made it, not necessarily in the way that they thought they would, but that's where they came. And now life comes full circle again in a final way for Gilbert. So going back to the scripture and some of the lessons from the scripture, you know, sometimes we find ourselves far from the Lord, far from where we were at one point, far from that relationship with the Lord. But the Lord seeks us to come full circle, to come back to him and to be with him. And it doesn't matter how long you warmed your hands by the fire.